In this recording, we'll discuss the external anatomy of the female as well as female hormones. Collectively, the female external genitalia are referred to as the vulva. This includes structures like the labia majora, which are a pair of um, elongated, fatty, protective skin folds. These are covered in pubic hair and contain adipose, oil glands, and sweat glands. And this is basically the female version of the male scrotum. We also have a paired set of thinner skin folds. These are the labia minora. They are enclosed within the majora and they are hairless. And that's really the easiest way to distinguish the two sets. The majora are covered in hair, the minora are hairless. We also have the clitoris, um, which is a small cylindrical mass. It is composed of erectile tissue. It sits anteriorly to the urethral orifice, and it plays a role in female sexual arousal. And this is basically the female version of the glands penis in the males. In addition to those structures, we also have the mons pubis. This is a fatty, rounded region that overlies the pubic symphysis. Okay, so we find this anteriorly in the body. This is also covered in hair after puberty. Then we have the vestibule, which is a recessed area enclosed by the labia minora. And among other things, the vestibule contains both the urethral and the vaginal orifices. And lastly, we have the greater vestibular glands, or if you prefer, Bartolian's glands. These glands secrete mucus directly into the vestibule during intercourse to help with lubrication. And there is one located on each side of the vagina, so these are a paired structure. All right, so just to get a visual, we've got the mons pubis, again, overlying the pubic symphysis. We can see um, hair has developed after puberty. You can vaguely see the pubic bones back here. We've got the labia majora. Now, normally these are covered in hair, but just so we can see all the other structures, this image doesn't actually show the hair. Um, the labia minora are thinner, okay, and enclosed by the majora, all right, and these aren't supposed to have hair, so that's accurate. And then we've got the urethral orifice, the vaginal orifice, and then the clitoris, and you can see the vestibule does house all of these orifices and glands. Okay. You can see that the anus sits more posteriorly. And then the perineum, which is a term that's fairly common, basically anything within this diamond-shaped region, okay, including the anus, is technically considered the perineum. All right, so we've done internal and external genitalia. Okay, so let's talk about hormones. Okay, so your ovaries, if you have them, are dormant um, until puberty hits. Okay, um, this happens somewhere between 11 and 13 years of age. Um, when you go through puberty, your good old pituitary gland starts to secrete FSH and LH. Why is it doing that? Because your hypothalamus has started to release GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone. Now this should sound familiar, okay? That's basically exactly how it worked in the males as well. Now follicle stimulating hormone FSH is going to cause the ovarian follicles to grow, to mature, and they will start secreting estrogen as well. Now, those ovarian follicles, that's where our oocytes are going to develop. Okay. And then luteinizing hormone, LH. This causes the mature follicle to actually rupture during ovulation. So the little egg can pop out of the follicle and make its way into the uterine tubes. The empty follicle will kind of degenerate into something called the corpus luteum 
Um, and once that happens, that corpus luteum starts to secrete progesterone and estrogen in preparation of fertilization. All right, in addition to FSH and LH, we also have estrogens. Okay, this is technically a group of female hormones. Okay. Uh, with quite a few functions. Promotes growth and development of female reproductive structures. Promotes oogenesis and follicle growth in the ovaries themselves. Um, causes the endometrium to grow and thicken each month. We call that the proliferative stage. Remember the endometrium is where the um, fertilized egg should be growing and developing. Causes the growth spurt at puberty, but also causes the epiphyseal plates to close. Um, so girls kind of start to go through their growth spurts a little sooner than males, but they also stop growing sooner as than males as well. So um, that's tends to be the reason that they don't get quite as tall, okay? And that's a very general statement, but that's just, again, general. And then last but not least, estrogens also help with the development of secondary sex characteristics like increased breast tissue growth, increased fat deposits in the hips and breast areas, and then growth of both pubic and axillary hair. And then we have progesterone. Okay. Progesterone works with estrogen to help prepare the endometrium. And again, remember the endometrium, that's where we're wanting to do implantation of that fertilized egg. And it also causes the endometrial glands to um, become secretory um, organs and prepares the mammary glands for milk secretions. Here we go. Okay. Now, the ovarian cycle, okay, so each month, fun things happen within the ovaries, okay, and again, this is monthly cycle, okay. This involves the maturation of an oocyte um, within a follicle, okay, as well as ovulation um, of that oocyte, so we can try to have fertilization, if that's the goal, okay. So once a month, um, a follicle re referred to as a graphian follicle, okay, moves towards ovary surface, okay, and when it is ready, it ruptures, okay, and when it ruptures, it releases something known as a secondary oocyte, okay. Now, we tend to throw around the word egg a lot, um, and that, that's okay, um, but technically, we should be using the term secondary oocyte when we're referring to anything um, after ovulation, okay? Now, a secondary oocyte is what is destined to become fertilized or not, technically. Um, but if fertilization does occur, it is with a secondary oocyte, okay? And we'll talk a little bit more later about um, primary versus secondary oocytes and things like that. Um, so that oocyte, the secondary one, technically, is going to then be swept into the uterine tubes by the waves created from the cilia. Okay, the cilia live specifically um, in like the infundibulum area, and so they're just kind of beating, they're creating these waves, the little oocytes getting swept in. Once it's in, there's also a little bit of peristalsis and a few more cilia to help it continue to move through the uterine tubes. Now, if fertilization occurs, it usually occurs within like the ampulla region of the fallopian tube, and this can occur up to 24 hours post ovulation. So secondary oocytes have a very limited lifespan if they are not fertilized. You only get about 24 hours to actually create a fertilized egg. Um, I like this picture because this little guy or girl, well, I guess girl because it's an egg, um, this is what ovulation looks like. So this part down here would be the graphene follicle and it has ruptured and boop, egg. Mm, look at it. I think it's kind of cute. Okay. Now, we're going to go with we have fertilized the egg. Okay. So after the sperm penetrates the secondary oocyte, okay, that in and of itself is referred to as fertilization. Once that happens, um, the second phase of meiosis 
is now completed. Okay, so we haven't really gotten into this quite yet, and we will, um, but meiosis in egg development doesn't work at the same pace as it does for sperm production. Okay, so oocytes actually don't finish meiosis unless they are fertilized, and that's okay. But once fertilization happens, the egg undergoes meiosis two. It's now a mature fertilized zygote. We now call it a zygote. Okay, the zygote then starts doing mitosis. Okay, and if you remember, mitosis is cell division for body cells. Meiosis is used to create sperm and egg to begin with. But once you fertilize that egg, once you have sperm plus egg, you don't need to make more sperm plus egg quite yet. We need to start making body cells. So we switch to mitosis. We call this whole process cleavage. Okay. Um, eventually, after about seven days, that zygote will reach the uterus and it will implant in the endometrium. Okay. By this point, we don't really call it a zygote anymore. Now we call it a blastocyst. Okay. And the terminology can get a little confusing. Um, it's not super important that we remember, you know, up to day seven, it's a, a zygote, but after day seven for a couple more days, it's a blastocyst, things like that. Don't get too bogged down in that. I'm just throwing around some terms in case you see them in other resources. Now, if by chance the oocyte was not fertilized, uh, remember it only lasts for about 24 hours, um, then it degenerates and it would just pass out through the menstrual flow. And this is kind of what it all looks like with the hormones thrown in there. So we would release GnRH from the hypothalamus, stimulates the anterior pituitary to release LH and FSH. Okay. Um, this causes the ovarian follicles to start secreting um, the estrogens, building up that follicle. Eventually this uh, secondary oocyte would rupture and that would cause ovulation.